Okay, so this was from a call I did earlier in the week, and um, I got a call for an exhaust not working. And uh, I went there, and I talked to the manager, this was in a restaurant, and they said, yeah, we had a power outage the other day, and when we came in um, this morning, the exhaust wasn't working. So I went over to the circuit breaker, first thing you check, easiest thing, circuit breaker, circuit breaker's tripped, okay. So now we got a problem. So shut the circuit breaker off, go up on the roof, and now with those two pieces of information, circuit breaker's tripped, they had a power outage, I could pretty much guess that it's a dead motor, and we'll explain why in a few minutes here. So I got there, took the cover off the exhaust, and dead giveaway. Big burn spot. This actually used to be the label, the tag for the motor, obviously burnt off. So this thing got smoking hot and I could actually see the wires melting out of the bottom of the motor. So obviously got a new motor, replacing it, we got it up and running. So I'm going to go over why this burnt out. Okay. Now, first things first, let's talk a little bit about single phase power and three phase power. So just for examples, and obviously these aren't the only examples, but power to your house, at least in the U.S., is is 208 volts single phase. So basically you have two power wires into your house, 208 volts between them, and 120 volts to ground, 115 volts to ground on each of them. Now, 208 and 230 are said interchangeably, 115 and 120 are said interchangeably, 460 and 480 are said inter interchangeably, so don't even harp on me that there's a difference between them. I know there's a difference between 240 volts and 208 volts, and some systems, depending on the way the, the uh, transformers are set up, some give 208 and some give 230, but in the field, they're used interchangeably, so don't even harp on me on that. So single phase you have two power lines so 208 between both of them 120 to ground on each one all right so that's residential very very normal uh, your typical commercial smaller commercial building can have that 208 single phase but more commonly has uh, three phase power usually 208 three phase so you have you add an extra power line so you have 320 volt lines, so 120 to ground, 120 to ground, 120 to ground, 208 between any two. Okay? Now that voltage can vary depending on what kind of commercial space you have. Typically, the small commercial space will have 208 to 30, three phase. Your larger commercial buildings, your high commercial buildings, like say your malls, strip malls, things like that, usually have 460, 480 volt. Um, yeah, high industrial buildings will usually be 600 volts and higher, so it depends on what you have for service. Now, the higher in voltage, the lower the amperage. That's the, that's the uh, benefit. So, now, uh, you can see this is a three-phase motor. You can see the size of it there in the background. Now, I'm going to slide over a single-phase motor. Granted, there is an age difference here, but I, do, I have a, um, almost a twin of this single phase motor out in my uh, almost a it was a it's a one horsepower single phase motor it's buried in my shed I don't want to go get it but you'll you'll get the idea when I slide this over this here is a half horse this is a one horse three phase motor this is a half horse single phase motor let me pan you up that would help okay so you can see there's actually not much of a size difference in there this is a full half horse bigger the one horse single phase that I have out, out in the shed is probably about this this far around and it's probably about that much taller. Okay, and it's got a capacitor on the top. So single phase requires something to start it. Okay. If we apply power to this motor right now, all it'll do if we well actually if we take this capacitor off, right, and apply power to this motor, all it'll do is sit there and hum until I give it a spin. Once I give it that go-ahead spin, then it'll start and run normally. This capacitor here is what gives it that kick to get started. Now, to control this capacitor and the, and the uh, start winding that it's connected to, it's connected to its own small winding, cannot take vo the voltage all the time. So we have to have something to take that start winding in and out of the circuit. 
So right now, while it's at rest, back here there's a centrifugal switch, and you can go, I actually rebuilt this motor, so you can actually go see all the guts of this motor uh, in this video up here. In the back of this motor here, there's a centrifugal switch. So right now that switch is closed because this motor is stationary, okay? When we apply power to this, <clears throat> excuse me, we give power to our main windings, and we also give power to our start winding. This motor starts to spin up. Once it hits a certain RPM, there are little weights on, on, the, on the contacts. The weights are thrown out, the contacts are disengaged, and that start winding is taken out of the circuit. Motor runs normally. So we have something, some way to start this um, motor. In the case of something like a refrigeration compressor, you'll have uh, the relay is outside of the compressor and it's usually in the, it looks like a little box and there's a start capacitor and a run capacitor. So you have three things to start a single phase compressor or a larger single phase compressor. Okay, so three phase motor, obviously benefit of a smaller frame, it's more efficient. Um, also, the wires feeding it won't need to be as thick. In other words, for the same size horsepower, amperage is lower, which is why your larger motors are usually three-phase, uh, or almost always three-phase. I think, I don't even, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what the largest single-phase motor is, but I haven't seen really a single-phase motor, in the field at least, that's over maybe five horsepower. Um, anything over that is usually three-phase motor. I mean, granted, I, I think they go up to 10, maybe, but um, most of them, mo most of your higher horsepower motors are going to be three-phase. So, what you can do, your three-phase power in, right, is three power lines in. In, in this case here, it's a 208 volt motor. Um, 320 volt lines, right, and each one is, set, uh, each one of these, the waveform on it, is separated by a 120 degree phase shift. So, um, picture, you know, your normal sine wave looking like that. You know, you'll have another one that starts down here, and you'll have another one that starts over here. So, the, the waveforms are 120 degrees apart, shifted, and that's what creates the magnetic field in a three-phase motor. Now all this technical garbage you guys can go look up on your own for our purposes here in normal practical mechanical stuff if fixing things means jack. All you gotta know is you can simplify everything like this. You have three power wires in, right? So two of those power wires are what run the motor. Now this somebody's gonna harp on me that's not correct I know it's not correct but you can pretty much simplify it down to this picture two power wires in as your power to your motor that runs your motor picture that third wire as the power that actually starts this motor rotation so picture this third wire here as your relay and your capacitor all in one so this third wire, wire, even though it has power to the motor all the time when, when, you, when you're running the motor, picture this third wire as the wire that starts it. So this third wire here eliminates any and all starting components, okay? So, and also another benefit of three phases, it's super easy to reverse the motor. All we do is take two phases and flip them around. And that creates the magnetic field the opposite way, allow you the motor to spin in the opposite direction. Okay, so we have three phase into the motor, and that runs it. Now, here's the problem with three phase motors, and especially when they told me that you have a power outage. If, for any reason, right, you lose one of these phases, guess what happens to this motor? Now, here's the funky thing. If this, if this motor is running, you have three phases in, if this motor is running, and you take one phase away, that motor will continue to run and it kind of fakes that third leg just by the rotation of the motor, okay? Somebody's going to say that's wrong, okay? So you can actually start a three-phase motor with single-phase power by giving the shaft a turn in whatever direction you want and it'll continue to carry on in that direction. Poor man's phase converter. 
But what happens is, is if this motor is at rest, as it is now, I only have two legs connected, I lost a third somewhere, either due to a power outage or a wire break-in or a contact to burn out, something screwed up this third leg and power is applied to this motor only on those two, these two legs, this happens. Basically what happens is, is it tries to start, all it does is sit there and hum and it burns out. Now, there is something that's in line with this that is supposed to stop this from happening and it's not the breaker. A breaker is not motor protection. A breaker is overcurrent protection. All a breaker does is protect the wire from catching on fire. Think of it that way. The only thing a breaker does is make sure that that wire, whether it be 12 gauge, 10 gauge, or whatever, so say in this case it's 12 gauge, 12 gauge wire rated for 20 amps, all that breaker is doing is making sure that that wire never sees more than 20 amps. Doesn't care what this motor is doing, all it cares about is that that wire never sees 20 amps. This motor is never going to draw 20 amps unless something is really, really, really wrong with it. Or you get an electrical short because it burns out. So what we do, especially with motors that are in exhausts and makeup airs and things like that, is we put in what's called a magnetic starter. The magne magnetic motor starter consists of two items. Basically, it's just a contactor with some sort of motor protection on it. Now, the motor pr protection could be two things. Sometimes it's a little, a little digital box that plugs into it with a little reset button and a dial that has amperages on it. Those are the newer style ones. The old style ones are a big honking thing with heaters. Now the heaters are a set of spring-loaded contacts that are held back by a drop of solder. Okay? Now that solder melts when the amperage goes too high. Those little contact, the heaters, there's two screws that usually hold them in and it's a cartridge that slides in and out and they're rated for different amperage loads so depending on what amperage load your motor's running at you size that heater accordingly if your motor sees more than that amperage which happen, what happens is that heater heats up that solder melts releasing the spring-loaded contacts and disengaging the contactor you go there the solder cools down it re-solidifies and it has a little reset button. You press that ring reset button in and it resets those spring-loaded contacts. That is your motor protection, okay? That obviously didn't work in this case, or actually it wasn't even there in this case, which is bad, but we rectified that and burnt out this motor. So right now, we're just gonna take this apart and see what this sucker looks like inside and how crispy critted it got. Okay, so the rotor and stuff off, and you can see here, bearings are fine, right? Bearings are nice. I'll check out the windings. So they completely melted. Actually, this side's better. This is the bottom here. You can see how hot, hot it got, melted. Actually, there's one of the wires that burnt right off and these are uh, actually that's part of the wires that that's the that little string stuff that they use but you can see how it basically fried the windings right out of there burnt off all the insulation and what was actually holding the rotor well, as you can see this stuff right here you can see that and that's all the insulation and compound that they have in between these bars here that melted out and stuck around that rotor and that's what was actually binding on it there so you can see how hot this got as the one drawback of three phase motors is if you lose a phase you are kinda of screwed and like I said in the case of uh, motor only applications like exhaust and stuff and I, I know in industrial applications you'll have uh, uh, starters and stuff and overload protection, but um, in the case of like rooftop units and stuff that has a three-phase blower motor, 90% of the time, unless it's a large, large, large unit, that, um, that motor in there does not have any kind of um, motor protection. You're just relying on 
a component to burn out, more or less. I mean, you, you're relying on either um, they'll, they'll, those motors will usually have an internal overload in them. They'll have an internal uh, thermal overload. Uh, this one, because of the case that it's an exhaust motor, exhaust motors usually don't have internal thermal overloads. The reason why is because you get nuisance strips um, because you're in a hot exhaust. Um, but in the case of a rooftop unit, that blower motor is usually in the evaporator section where it's nice and cool. Um, so those motors there, they'll have some sort of internal thermal protection. But in the case of these, um, you know, 90% of the time they do not. And you get this, which is why we have the starters and the heaters or overloads in line with the protect to protect them. But in this case, you know, no protection. Now, I understand this wasn't overly technical, and some of the stuff I said technically wasn't correct um, as far as the electrical, how the three-phase works, but we're just simplifying it so you can kind of get the point across is how a three-phase motor works and why it burns out and basically what to look for when you're fixing these things. Because that's what I do. I am not a professor. I fix shit. So, thanks for watching this video. Hope you liked it. See you on the next one.